Welcome to First Person. I'm Lisa Van Dusen, and I'm here today with Camilla Olson, who is a serial biotech entrepreneur turned fashion entrepreneur. Her company, Savitude, has just launched a new shopping app for all working women based on body shape. And it's nice to be here with you, Camilla. Nice to be here, too. Thanks for having me, Lisa. I'd love to start out with kind of big picture uh, what you what you do and why you do what you do and kind of what you're especially excited about at this point in your life and you can I know you've done many things had a number of startups in your career and, and other pursuits but if you so you can answer that question kind of very zoomed out so I have had a couple of phases in my life um, uh, for a big part, when you first started talking about the biotech side of my life, I was really interested in medicine and health and trying to help cure diseases. So I started a few companies then to help people get better. And I was really interested in pregnancy and neonatal care, especially. Um, and that led me into pharmaceutical, improving the drug delivery uh, drug development and the clinical trial area. And so I, I, I was trying to improve that process so uh, medicines could get to people faster. I really wanted to help solve that problem. Um, and that I felt like I made contributions there um, and stopped. Um, and life led me to fashion some crazy way. Um, and now I've continued my interest in women but now I'm trying to help women move forward, trying because things are are not equal. There's not an equal playing field in the workforce and socially for women. And I'd like to make a contribution to help make that level. Was there a particular person or experience um, kind of in your formative years that made you want to help women in these two ways um, or in general? I, uh, I can just remember from being a freshman in college and living in a collective house and we were feminists. <laughs> so ever since then, or even in high school, I mean, it's just been a part of me to always want to help women. So I just have that bone um, of wanting to help women and it hasn't well, I guess if I were to go back and think of a particular person, there was my homeroom teacher in high school, Sherry Reader, um, who uh, instilled some of those thoughts. And I have to, if I were to thank somebody, that would be her. And what can you give an example of kind of what those thoughts were that? Um, well, I was in an all-girls Catholic school, so this actually would have been sophomore year, and she was homeroom teacher, and she, so it was a pretty strict, you know, uniform uh, school, and she was not a nun, she was a lay teacher, and she spoke freely, was, and at that time, so it was quite a while ago, no one did that, um, and she didn't last all that long in the school. Um, but um, she spoke freely, um, and she was very much involved in the uh, Washington, D.C. area uh, countercultural community. In fact, she lived at the Quook Silver Times Collective. Um, so she just talked a lot of radical ideas to us in the classroom. So it was enlightening. <laughs> Can you point to any key intersections or choice points in your life? I mean, you referenced that you know, your, your switch over from biotech to fashion industry. Mm -hmm. That might be one, but there might be others. Yeah, there have been a lot. Uh, I think the one in the fashion is the, the funniest one because that was the, the least, I mean, I would have bet a lot of money this would never have happened because I've spent all my life saying I didn't have the fashion gene and never understood it. In fact, I, I fought with my daughter when she was young that she could, shouldn't be a fashion designer because she wanted to do that. And I took her to um, uh, some open houses so that she could see why it was not a good thing to do. But the trick was when I did that, I got seduced into it. Oh, open houses for going to school? In yes, mm -hmm. to go, yes, uh, open houses for schools. And uh, so 
So yeah, that was really super unexpected. Um, and where did that come from? What, where, where were the seeds for that? How did, well, I started, uh, well, when I was younger, um, my mother sewed clothes for me um, for a number of reasons. Um, and then, and I sewed my clothes too. But they were awful. The design and the quality was terrible. And I, and I was embarrassed, but I kept trying and trying and trying. And it just never, I really wanted to make a Chanel jacket. And I couldn't duplicate it. Even if I had one in the closet, I, I just didn't work. Um, and I couldn't understand why. But when I went on the open house, I was like, this is where I can learn how to do that. I tell you, all my life I wanted to have a room where I could go in and sew any time. Um, and so I finally got that mm -hmm. and had the skills to go use it. And that was a treasure when I had it. So you then mm -hmm. went on to go to fashion design school yourself? I did, I did. And I earned an MFA in fashion design and had a runway show in Lincoln Center and just blew my mind that I was able to do that. I'm very excited that I was able to do it, and I still think it's kind of a dream. So, fast forward. Yes. You then, you, well, describe Camille Olson, your line, and then the transition to Sabitude. Uh, well, I, um, I, so I got seduced in the whole fashion school thing to, um, try to be a fashion designer and I started off with high-end uh, clothes trying to d dress women you know that I knew it was so expensive to have that line it's to, to develop the samples and to sell I mean we were self-funding out of you know our own savings and it became too much for us so in order to stay in business I had to change the price point and I was moving more towards the working woman um, and really, really wanted to um, develop clothes that women could wear to work because people kept telling me, I can't find clothes to wear to work. So can you, you know, and I was asked to please make clothes for that. So I moved into that marketplace. But, it, you know, I was an utter failure. Um, you know, when women came and tried it on, they liked it, but I just couldn't sell at retail. Um, and, you know, what I found is that the retailers didn't want to carry work clothes. And, you know, what I observed is that they wanted to carry m much more younger, sexier clothes um, for other purposes. After work clothes. After work clothes, yeah, after work clothes. Well, that's a good way to put it. Um, and so I stopped designing last September and decided, you know, and I realized that there is no way to reach the working woman. Um, and while I had invested so much in being a fashion designer, that wasn't my purpose. My purpose was to help the working woman. And I decided, well, I can put fashion design aside and figure out how to get what I wanted, what she needed. And so I made a business choice to build a channel to reach her um, and let the design go and to bring other people's designs through this channel. So it was a big change, a big pivot. Um, and I thought it was going to be harder um, but, you know, it wasn't that hard, it, you know, it was a lot easier than I thought. Shifting to where we are, yeah. um, as opposed to what you're doing, can you talk a little bit about if it makes a difference to you that you are located here in Palo Alto, in Silicon Valley? I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't live here, that's for certain. Um, I started out as a venture capitalist in New York um, and they moved me out here and I mean I didn't want to move I didn't want to leave Manhattan um, but I moved I reluctantly um, but I'm thrilled I came um, and I left um, my firm after four years and I moved to the other side of the table and became an entrepreneur I 
feel that becoming an entrepreneur really let me grow it to be the person that I am, that, that it allowed me to, to really be able to be responsible, to make decisions, to see something grow. I, I wouldn't know how to start a company. If I were still living in New York, I would be doing something way different than what I'm doing right now. I, I don't know what that would be, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't, I would be taking advantage of what's inherent in New York. It, it would be a completely different world. Maybe I'd be in the arts, maybe I'd be doing something else. It wouldn't be this. Because it's so, it's just so prevalent here? Yeah. I'm it's, somewhat it's of a chameleon. I'm pretty adaptable and some, very curious of what's around me and influenced by what's around. I mean, I know who I am, mm -hmm. but I'm cu really curious of who and what is around me. And I want to find out what it is. And my mind is so full of ideas. And I just, I love to improve things. I, I mean, I, I'm like, you know, I'm always making suggestions of, oh, they can make this better by doing that. And, you know, soon and often there's a company there. Do you consider yourself an outlier? Yeah, I do. But not in a special way. I mean, I don't feel like I'm special. <laughs> I feel, but I do, I do know that I'm different from a lot of people. Can you say more about that? Mm. Um, because that I do have opinions, um, some people don't like that, and that becomes hard socially, you know. People don't always want the truth. They don't want that. Well, they know, I, you know it's an opinion. It may not be the truth, yeah. but people don't like other people making opinions or observe, you know, whether it's a judgment or not, people don't like being observed. I like to observe you know, lots of behavior, um, and it, it just find it really interesting. And I think that's because when I was really little, I didn't have really good role models, and I didn't have a lot of instruction. So I like to look to others to say, oh, that's how you do that, or that's how you behave there. I'm still learning in a lot of ways, so I look to learn from others. Uh, what advice would you offer people transitioning from one field to another? I think that the thing is, you know, people are afraid, and I think that it, the best thing you can do is to stop and try and let go of that fear. I don't understand the, the fear of changing what you're doing. Um, because you have to do something every day and you have to be happy doing that. So when you're, when you're going to change from one thing to another, um, follow your heart. I mean, you really need to quiet things down and start listening. When I'm in a situation when I need to make a change or make a decision, I actually know that I need to make a decision you know, or I need to, I know something is going to change coming up. You know, you, rec you know enough in life that that's coming up. And I pause and I, and I tell myself, you got to start watching. And I clear enough space in my brain to allow for more observation because something will pass in front of me that will tell me what it is. And, and I don't know where that comes from. You know, you can guess, you know, all sorts of things um, and put your own, you know, philosophy in there. But something always happens in front, passes in front of me that tells me where I'm going to be going next. And it is always fruitful. But if you quiet your mind and if you, you know, just pause enough it will come and you'll, it will reveal itself. It always reveals itself what you should do next and where you should go and how it works. Um, so I think, you know, if you just allow things to happen, it'll happen. Well, thank you. Thank you.